Alright, hopefully that's close enough in terms of the... And hopefully the clicker will now work. Alright, everybody's helping with Adobe. Alright, so what I want to do today is talk about one of my favorite applications of probability. It's too baseball. And so I'm hoping eventually the... Okay, good, the web address will be... Okay, so again, these slides are available online. Uh, the video will be available online. How many of you stayed up till around 12.30 or so last night? Excellent, good choice. <coughs> My dad was at the game. Your dad was at the yeah. game? No. I want to call, I want to see copy the ticket. Okay. Uh, I actually I, have, And he's safe for the whole game? He's safe for the whole okay. game. Okay. I, I have a picture on the phone of him with the ticket right now. Alright, so the Patriots had a wonderful comeback last night. What I like about this is I don't have that many opportunities to give my son math problems anymore about sports because the Red Sox are no longer playing. He was told the total score was 10 points, less than 3 quarters of 100, and the Patriots won by 3. So during today's lecture, you can try to figure out what the score of the Patriots game was if you don't know what it was ahead of time. So 10 points, less than 3 quarters of 100 was the total, Patriots won by 3. Alright, so Cameron and Kayla have helped me with this talk. Uh, sometimes Cameron is able to give this talk with me, but he had school today. So this is dedicated to my great uncle Newt, who told me when I was young I would live long enough to see the Red Sox win the World Series. Mm -hmm. And so Cameron somehow woke up around 8.30, I'm sorry, around uh, the bottom of the 8th in Game 6 of the World Series this year to watch the end of it. And as I'm putting him back to bed, you know, I told him, you know, you are named after my great uncle Newt. And you know, he told me I would live long enough, and now you have lived long enough. And you know, he's half asleep and goes, Daddy, yeah, I did it a lot younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay. So, now it is tax deductible taking my kids to the Red Sox because this is now being used for academic purposes. So this is the family and Wally the Green Monster. So I want to talk to you about the Pythagorean one-loss formula today, or the one-loss theorem, depending if you're a mathematician or a sabermetrician. How many of you have heard of the Pythagorean one-loss formula? I've heard the name. Your hand has to go up. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so I want to derive the Pythagorean one loss formula and talk a little bit about you know what it's used for. I'm sorry? I'm just looking at the slides that we Okay. <laughs> There's something else you should be looking at on this slide. Oh the thirty-one to thirty-four. Right. So I want to derive the Pythagorean one loss formula. I want to observe some ideas and techniques of mathematical <coughs> modeling. So if you enjoy stuff like this, there will be a class. Uh, next year on mathematical modeling, 4xx, I forget exactly what number it will be. I want you to see how advanced theory enters into very simple problems. If you've ever done the drowning swimmer problem in calculus, you know, where you're trying to find what is the best path to the drowning swimmer, if you don't care about you know, people on the beach, you can just get them out of your way and whatnot. <laughs> you have a very simple equation, but it leads to having to solve a fourth order polynomial, and you have to get into the theory of how would you approximate solutions. Very simple problems very quickly get into interesting complications, and we'll see that here. There are opportunities from inefficiencies. How many of you have read Moneyball or seen the movie? So if you have a better knowledge of statistics and mathematics than the people around you, you are allowed to take advantage of their ignorance. This is socially acceptable, and in fact, it's encouraged in certain situations. And so if teams value the wrong statistic, you can take advantage of it. So one of my favorite examples is the definition of a save in baseball. Who can tell me what a save is in baseball? Right, you're on the spot. Um, now, you're on the team, right? Yeah. So if you get this wrong, this will be extremely embarrassing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's depending on the situation, yes. it could be up to like five runs in, a, in the ninth inning, but it's really just getting the last, like, either like two, in, two innings uh, without giving up the lead if you're a relief pitcher. What position do you play? Sure, so. Okay, so it's okay that you don't understand the notion of it. No, I know, I know. It's just, it's just like. It's so, just, well, what's the actual definition of a save? It's closing out the game. No, you have to be more specific. You have to be within two runs. Nope. Three runs. Three, three, runs. Three, within three runs. Three, five. And not give up the lead in the last two innings, or pitch nope. three innings of relief. Without yeah. giving I mean, we've got basically the cooked elements scattered. You have to either a come in with a 3-1 lead or less and hold on to the lead and close out the game or pitch at least the last three innings without giving up the lead. So a couple of years ago the Texas Rangers were playing the Baltimore Orioles. After six innings Texas was leading 14-3. to For the remaining three innings Texas could alternate giving up a home run out, home run out and they would still win the game. 
the pitcher got the remaining um, nine outs without giving up any runs, while Texas went on to score 16 more to win 30 to 3. So he came in with an 11 run lead, he got 16 unanswered runs. The game was never in jeopardy. My grandmother might have been able to save this game. Okay? Technically, that counts as a save. There's a lot of statistics in, ba in baseball that people like, but don't really measure what they are supposed to be measuring. And so when you hear the word save, you, know, you, you think something was in jeopardy. Somebody did a really good job. You know, pitching with a 11 run lead, you know, the average team scores about four or five runs in a game. So this is not, a, this should not be a safe situation. So Billy Bean of the Oakland days, you know, took advantage of people who did not truly understand the value of certain statistics, and he would inflate pitcher save statistics by putting them in only and say, oh, you want my star closer who's so good at getting those valuable saves? Well, I, I hate to part with him, but I do need a second baseman, so okay. Mm -hmm. You can only do this so many times. But he was able to do this very successfully for a while. And then last, if people are interested, there are some opportunities for further research. I have uh, one student who's actually working on generalizations of this right now for his senior thesis. Right. So the goal is to go from this, you know, just sitting on the bench and just watching what's going on, to being an active participant in the game, or of course, to getting a ring. Uh, sadly, I had to give the ring back, but that is a Red Sox World Series championship ring. All I will say is, um, I love answering that question. It's the 07 model. Uh, all I will say is I do still have both of my rings and my son. And not that. Okay. So this is, you know, Fenway Park. Can anybody tell me what the objective is in baseball? Win. How do you win? Score runs. You score more runs than the other team. Yeah. Okay? That's essentially all you need to know. That plus... What else do you need to know about baseball? Given that I'm from Boston. Opposite of that. The Yankees have a worse team. Yankees, Yankees suck. Something along those lines, yes. Red Sox good, Yankees bad. It's like Yankees and the Amherst. Yankees are the Amherst of baseball. <laughs> <laughs> or the Harvard or the Michigan, yes. Any of these words are acceptable. Uh, they have much better scoreboards and you know, display screens than when I was a kid. They now keep track of how many pitches have been thrown, what percent are strikes, uh, and stuff to see. They give you new statistics such as RISP. Anybody know what RISP is? Runners yes. In, runners in scoring. Runners in scoring position. So there's a whole alphabet soup of statistics now. And again, when the statistics were first being created for baseball, this was a game 1800s. People doing this with you know pencil on paper. It's very hard to have all the data available. We can collect so much data now. There is just incredible wealth of opportunities. And if you don't take advantage of it, you're at a huge disadvantage relative to other teams. When I was a postdoc at Ohio State, I was a participant in a data analysis seminar, and one of the quotes has really stuck with me. The weather satellites orbiting the Earth beam down more information every day than is in the entire Library of Congress. And the weather forecasters have a couple of hours to do something with it. And so how do you extract something useful out of all of this massive amounts of data? So this is where probability, statistics, mathematical modeling come into play. All right, so I want to you know, finally get to what is the Pythagorean one-loss formula. I'm going to concentrate on baseball for a couple of reasons. For the most part, it's the easiest to isolate the contributions of individuals. Although for a lot of what I'm doing here, this would apply to baseball, football, soccer, and basketball. All I really care about today is what's the probability a team wins. That said, there is a huge advantage baseball has over these other sports. So you need to know a little bit of baseball knowledge now. What advantage does baseball have over these other sports? Um, it's sort of, it's a little bit more sort of sequential, like, you know, it's very ordered. Like, each team's going to go up, like, nine times. Well, but I only care about trying to predict a team's winning percent. I want to try to predict how often does a team win. They're in the street. Same other sports. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. They play a lot more games. They play a lot more games. Baseball has twice as many games as football. Oh, sorry, twice as many games. Oh, it does. Uh, it also has three times as many, four times as many. It has basically ten times as many games as football. About twice as many games as basketball and hockey and, you know, soccer. You know, it's... Okay. So you have a wealth of data. And in a lot of things, we ask, you know, for, you know, rate of convergence. 
the more observations you have, the more data points you have, the better conversions you're going to have. So in baseball, we have a huge advantage. So here are the three parameters. RS observed is going to be the average number of runs scored per game. RA observed is average number of runs allowed per game. And gamma is some parameter constant for the sport. So baseball will have a different gamma than basketball, than football. And so the Pythagorean one loss formula uh, was discovered by Bill James you know, several decades ago. And it was a numerical observation of just playing with winning percentages. And he observed that a team's winning percentage, you know, number of wins over number of games, is very well approximated by RS observed to the gamma over RS observed to the gamma plus RA observed to the gamma. And for him, he took gamma to be about 2. So can you figure out why he called this the Pythagorean one loss formula? Yes, it looks a lot like the Pythagorean theorem, the, you know, from classical geometry. You know, baseball is not a game about triangles unless you draw the auxiliary line between home plate and you know, second base and split the infield into two triangles. Right? It's a diamond. There's no triangles or right geometry going in here. But you know, hey, it looked similar to something he had seen in geometry class, so why not call it the Pythagorean one loss formula? He got the best fit value of two just by looking at things and just saying, yeah, two seems to do a pretty good job, and it's easy for me to do two on the calculators of the time. So if you think back as to you know, what features you had on a calculator you know, 40 years ago. Now, if you have things to other powers, well, you could always take logarithms, multiply, and exponentiate, but that's a lot of work. And so you know, if you use squares, you have a square button, or you can just multiply the number by itself. This is one of the things to remember that when a lot of statistics are being designed, they were being designed at times with different computing power than we have now. We have so much computing power now, we don't care if the formula is a bit more complicated. You know, the computers can handle that very easily. The best fit value for gamma is about 1.82 now. And this is just what's been observed numerically when you look at you know, many seasons of data. And I want to show you how you can get this from some reasonable assumptions and some things we've done in probability this semester. So you know, let's look at 2009. The Red Sox finished 95 and 67. They scored 872 <coughs> runs, allowed 736, for a prediction of 93.4, very close to the actual value. The Yankees were 103 but they were predicted to be 95.2. Okay, obviously the 0 0.2 you have to throw away, stuff like this. But the question is, you know, how accurate do you expect this formula to be? You did a really good job for the Red Sox, did a very poor job for the Yankees. And when you're trying to figure out who's going to win a division, you know, four or five game swings is huge, and this is even more than that. And so a big question is going to be, how accurate do we expect a formula like this to be? Okay. Uh, 2011, I don't know how many of you remember the 2011 season. According to the predictions, the Red Sox should have finished 95 and 67, and Tampa Bay should have been 92 and 70. The pictures I was actually showing you were from the 2011 season, watching the Red Sox play. This was when they lost on the last day of the season and were eliminated from the playoffs, and Tampa Bay just squeaked in, with the Yankees giving up a 7-1 lead late in the game by, I think, essentially telling their pitchers, throw, you know, hanging strikes down the middle. You, know, you can never prove it, but all right. why do we care about the Pythagorean one loss formula? Here are three reasons. How many of you are considering a career in economics or finance? All right. If you're considering something like that, if you don't care about baseball, here's other reasons you can care about. So one is extrapolation evaluation. Let's say you have some stock or mutual fund and you're trying to figure out, is this undervalued or overvalued? You want to find a really good metric that is going to be predictive of future performance based on current results. So the question is, is somebody overperforming or underperforming? A couple of years ago, the Yankees started <coughs> off uh, 22 and 28. As a Red Sox fan, I was quite happy to see the Yankees you know, well below 500. So the question the New York Yankees have to ask themselves is, do they see themselves as a bad team? If so, they should conserve their resources and basically give up on this season and concentrate on future years. Or maybe they've had a string of bad luck and maybe they're not as bad as their record indicates. All the metrics said the Yankees were not as bad as their record indicated. This was the year they signed Roger Clemens, they made some very expensive moves, and they actually made the playoffs. Uh, two years ago, the Baltimore Orioles made the playoffs. I think they might have set the record for most 1-1 you know, victories, you know, for the highest percentage. It was absolutely absurd how many close games the Orioles just edged out. And you know, again, when you're trying to estimate who is a threat, you can use metrics like this to predict, you know, how well do I expect this team to be doing 
versus how well have they actually done. So again, just because you've won 60% of your games so far doesn't mean you're going to continue to win at 60%. That said, <coughs> lucky streaks do happen. Uh, the last is you know, an advantage. When you're trying to figure out how much to spend on a player, how much are they bringing to your team, we actually have formulas that allow people to estimate how many runs a player will produce for you per year, both as a batter and as a field in terms of their defense, or as a pitcher, how many runs they'll give up. And so when you're trying to figure out, I have so much money to sign, unless I'm the New York Yankees, or maybe a few other you know, teams, how do I want to allocate my funds among the different free market players? So the Red Sox fans, you know, it's how much money is Jacoby Ellsbury going to want? For the Yankee fans, you know, how much money is Kano going to be willing to accept to stay in New York? How much are they worth? You know, do you really want to give a 10-year contract with you know, this much money to a player? And so when you try to estimate how many runs are they, are they generating for your team, you can then translate that into how many wins you expect to get. If you go from you know, winning 50 games to winning 70 games because you signed a player, did that player add a lot to your team? There's 162 games in the year. Go from winning 50 games to 70 games. Did that player add a lot? Is that player worth a huge amount of money? Well, this, this is where things get interesting. What, so you go from winning 50 games a year to winning 70 games a year. You still stink. You're still not going to make the playoffs. Right? <coughs> so the question is, you know, will enough fans come to the games now because you've got this star player? Will enough people buy merchandise to recoup the salary? There's a huge financial gain from making the playoffs. So when you're trying to figure out how much somebody is worth, not all wins are equal. <coughs> going from you know, 50 wins to 70 wins is not as valuable as going from 90 wins to 95 wins. Or 95 wins to 100 wins. You get to 100 wins and you're almost surely in the playoffs. And so you really want to evaluate, not in isolation, how much a player is worth, but as a part of a team. Okay, so you know, just you know, some data from 2004, randomly chosen year. You know, you can look and see how the Red Sox would do. On May 1st, the formula predicted us to finish with 99 wins. On June 1st, 93. On July 1st, 90. August 1st, 92. And they finished incredibly strong and ended up with 98 wins. There's lots of fluctuations in formulas like this. The longer data sets you have, the more accurate formulas like this are. People often use formulas like this to try to estimate how much value does a manager add to a team. And they basically credit a lot of your excess above the prediction as to the value the manager adds by using the bullpen appropriately, by setting people in good situations for substitutions. And conversely, if you're going below the prediction, to measure how much harm the manager is causing your team. Okay, so I've often given this uh, talk in uh, my Calc 3 class where I have a very brief introduction to probability. I'm going to assume that this is not really necessary for this class. However, this is the last week of the course. It's not necessarily a bad idea to just quickly review what I've done. How many of you have seen this game Plinko from um, Price is Right? So I will uh, try to remember to include an interesting article there are certain games in Prices Right where people have analyzed the data and have come up with winning strategies. They win 100% of the time against the uh, games as they're being played. There are some games that are luck, and you know, there's nothing you can do about this. You know, Plinko, this is luck. What theorem is this? So you drop the ball, and every time it hits a pin, it equally goes left to right. Flipping coins. So what theorem is going to tell me where it's landing? Binomial, or more generally? Multinomial? No, I mean, it's a binomial. Okay. What's the binomial <laughs> going to look like as I do more and more tosses? Or as I get more and more binomial. pins? What's it going to converge to? The normal. the normal. So if you've ever gone to the Museum of Science in Boston, they have a really nice example of this where you see the balls dropping. They even have, most of the balls are black, they have a couple of white balls, just so you can look for like every hundredth or something like that. But the distribution should be approximately normal. It'll technically be a binomial. <coughs> And so, you know, not much you can do in terms of the randomness. And so if you notice, the big money right here in the middle, but if you just miss, you get zero. If you aim for the edge, you know, you're not going to get the big payoff, but you guarantee yourself with high likelihood of getting something. So then the question is, you know, which strategy do you pursue? Alright, so the goal is to model the observed scoring distributions. Uh, so imagine we observe something like this. And I want to figure out what would be a reasonable model 
for baseball team scores. So we should all know this. If x is a random variable with a density, then it's going to be non-negative. It'll integrate to 1. And the probability it takes on a value between a and b is just the area under the curve from a to b. This is why, or at least one of the reasons why, we care about integration. Integration gives us probabilities. All right, the mean, or the average value, is just the integral of x p of x. The variance is just a measure of how spread out things are. It's the integral of x minus mu squared. OK, so the last thing we need is your know, independence. So knowledge of one random variable gives no knowledge of the other. Uh, we do not have a central limit theorem for sums of dependent random variables. We need things to be independent. Probabilities are much easier to calculate if they're independent. I calculate one thing, then I multiply by the probability the other happens. Okay. How many of you have watched the Charlie Browns? No. So, to see how many people would actually get the baseball reference. So, here are the two guidelines for modeling. You want to capture the key features of the system, and the model should be mathematically tractable. What's the problem? So I want to do these two things. Any issues with this? What if they're mutually exclusive? So it's not a what if. <laughs> Typically, they compete in opposite directions. The more features you capture, the more complicated your model is, and the more bells and whistles you have to add, and the harder it is to get anything useful or anything tractable out of it. So you might have heard of the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid. You know, the more features you add, the harder it's going to be at the end of the day to get anything out of it. So what you want to do is you want to say what really matters. How many of you have heard of the Galileo experiment where he drops the two balls from the leaning tower of Pisa? For extra credit, what were the colors of the balls? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Why? Well, let's see. Let it, what if one of the balls was black and one of the balls was white and we left it out on a hot sunny day for a couple of hours and now one of the balls is really hot? Will a hot object cause differences than a cold object in how it falls? I don't know. I'm only one fan. You're only what? So, one would hope that this is a much lower order effect, right? That you know, the color of the ball is not going to really affect what's going on. Okay, so you have to try to decide which things really matter, which things don't. Alright, so here is a possible model that the runs scored and runs allowed are two independent random variables, and they're given by some probability density functions. Can anybody give me any issues with this? Yes? Well, they're probably not independent. Okay, so why not? Um, because they're all statistics of your team, so like. Well, one is your pitching team, one is your hitting. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, those are usually the same people, more or less. But that, and, that's and it's dependent on the team you're playing. So okay, so so maybe if I have, if I want to score, for some, uh, when the Red Sox go to the National League, do they put David Ortiz at first base to keep his bat in, and maybe sacrifice the defense? Although he did get Jeff Supon going from third to home to third to home to third to home in 2004. Okay, what else? If it's like a low-scoring game, your offensive strategy you might change. Yeah, if it's a low-scoring game, uh, especially in the game, you might play, rather than play for a beginning, you might just play for that one run. What else? There's at least two other things I want to mention. Anybody remember Remlinger? Fortunately, he didn't pitch for the Red Sox too long. Uh, at one point, he came in, the Sox were leading 10-3 to 3 in the ninth. And when they brought him in, they didn't list his ERA because it was plus infinity. He had never gotten anybody out as a Red Sox. He had allowed runs, he just hadn't gotten anybody out. And the networks didn't have the symbol for plus infinity, so they just had three dashes. He proceeded to give up a grand slam. He did get the three outs, and the Red Sox did win the game. But it got a lot closer than it should have been. They never would have brought him in if it wasn't 10-3. to three. But you know, 10-3, you know, we figure he can give up six ones or less and get three out. Surely that shouldn't be too hard for him. And he made it closer than expected. <laughs> or maybe you might remember, you know, Gagne, or a few other people the Red Sox have gotten over the years. When you have a big lead, you might let some of your, you know, hitters have some rest and sit down. Or you might put in some weaker pi in your pitches to eat up innings and save the better pitches for later. There is another reason why runs scored and runs allowed are not independent. Where knowledge of one does give you knowledge of the second. Can you give me an example? 
It has to do with the great and mighty Bud Selig. Long may he reign. Long may he make baseball always interesting. They can never be equal. They can never be equal. Right? It has been declared a catastrophe, a horror beyond horrors, for a baseball game to end in a tie. Football survived it yesterday with the Packers and the Vikings. Uh, the Patriots and the Broncos almost ended up in a tie as well. Football, hockey has ties all the time. Baseball will not have a tie. So a couple of years ago, you know, another example with the Orioles, the Red Sox were playing the Orioles. They were losing 5 to nothing in Fenway after, nine, after the top of the ninth. In the bottom of the ninth, the Red Sox scored six runs. And so if you say the Orioles scored five, you don't know what happens, but you know the Red Sox don't end with five. Games don't end in ties. So can runs scored and runs allowed be independent? No. So we actually want to modify our notion of independence to allow this very special type of dependence. Another example where you might see this is trying to estimate how certain drugs do in hospitals. <clears throat> you have the hope that you know, when you go into the hospital, you at least don't leave sicker than when you arrived. This is not always the case. You know, there are times when the new drugs really don't work, or the doctors you know, sadly misread the charts to remove the wrong organ. These things happen. Typically, however, you should not leave worse than when you arrive. So when you're trying to estimate you know, the likelihood of various events, you have to take into account that I don't expect certain events to be attainable. So when I'm looking at comparisons between runs scored and runs allowed, especially those of you who have taken stats, you have to use a modified chi-squared you know, R by C contingency table. You have to take into account what's called structural zeros, and I talk about this in the appendices over here if you're really interested. How do you handle the fact that runs scored and runs allowed can't be independent? You know, one solution, and I can't say since this is being recorded, is a certain thing you could do to Bud Selig and Major League Baseball. They're not going to change the rule. So we have to find mathematical or statistical ways to deal with this. Alright, so the one loss formula comes down to computing the following. If I model runs scored and runs allowed as continuous random variables, well the probability that the runs scored equals the runs allowed, that's a zero probability event. So if y is runs allowed and x is runs scored, I just integrate over the region where I score more runs than I allow. If I do things discrete, I just sum over all pairs i and j. i is the number of runs scored and it's greater than the number of runs allowed. Which model do you think I should use for baseball? Continuous or discrete? Discrete. Exactly, we should use the continuous. So why should we use the continuous? And it's not because we can take logarithms. <clears throat> Integrals are easier. To Integrals are easier than sums. So in order to extrapolate nice closed form expressions, it's technically much easier to work with discrete, I'm sorry, with continuous random variables than discrete, because we have the tools of calculus at our disposal. Technically, this does allow the possibility for the Red Sox to beat the Yankees by a score of pi to e. I would love to see something like that happen. I, occasionally, there are whoopsies on ESPN or MLB where they actually post the wrong numbers. I have actually seen negative runs in an inning for a team. And you know, usually in a couple of minutes, ESPN realizes that something wrong was inputted. I have yet to see a non-integer entered for a score. I'm waiting to see that. I have seen negative numbers. Okay? You could have a pi to e score. Well, what we'll do is, you know, if you score a run, maybe what we'll do is we'll have our bins go from 2.5 to 3.5. And anything between 2.5 and 3.5, we'll call that three runs. Anything between 1.5 and 2.5, we'll call that two runs. So we're reduced to calculating the following. We've talked a little bit about some of the issues. Now some new questions are, what should we choose for the, for the densities, runs scored and runs allowed? Are they independent random variables? No. And then related to the first, can we actually calculate these in closed form? And for the ones I'm going to show you, the answer is yes, because they were specifically chosen to allow myself to calculate them in closed form. In general, uh, it's extremely hard to get a closed form solution. You can do Monte Carlo simulations, you can do numerical integration, but the problem is then you can't sniff out the parameter dependence. I want to know if I increase my run scores by 5% and decrease my runs allowed by 2%, how many more games do I expect to win? Well, I can just recompute things, but it would be nice to have a closed form expression to be able to immediately see how valuable that is. All right, so here's a possible suggestion for how runs are scored in a baseball game. The uniform distribution drawn from 0 to 10. So you need to have a little bit of knowledge of baseball, what's wrong with this? Oh, 
You'll be on the hot seat all day. Uh, I'm just really confused. Why you so, I'm sorry? I'm just confused why you picked 0 to 10. Well, I'm just arbitrarily saying 0 to 10 in the uniform distribution. So one tenth of the time you score zero ones, one tenth of the time you score one ones, one tenth of the time you score ten ones, and you never score more than ten ones. Or actually, I guess one tenth of the time you score nine ones, you never score more than ten. So is this a reasonable model for baseball? No. No. It's mathematically tractable. It's nice, but it has absolutely no relation to reality. Well, what about the Gaussian? We love Gaussians. Things become normally distributed. So why don't I use a Gaussian? It's negative. Yes. No matter how bad you are, and normally I would use the Pittsburgh Pirates as an example, but this year I can't. Normally I would use the Kansas City Royals, but also this year I can't. Astros. I can't use the Astros. They actually lost more than one out of every three. I'm sorry, they won less than one out of every three games. So as bad as the Astros were this year, the Astros will not score negative runs in a game. Unless they do something wrong on the score. Unless they do something wrong on the score. Now there's also a small issue with this as well. In addition to scoring negative number of runs, you can score anything. You could score infinite. So even if I shift to an exponential, which fixes the fact that I don't allow myself to score negative runs, I actually have a probability of scoring a trillion runs in a game. Fortunately, if I choose my things appropriately, the probability of scoring a trillion runs is so negligible, I don't have to worry about that. And isn't that true in real life? Yes. In theory, you can score a lot. Yeah. Yes. Baseball is, of, of the major sports, baseball is the one sport where you are not out of it until the game is over. In football, there is a physical time limit for the fastest person to run all the way down the field. And at some point, there's just not enough time left to come back if you're down by enough. Uh, college football, I think I told you the most lopsided score of all time, 222 to 0. Huh? You know, at some point, even if Georgia Tech decided to just go home and tell you know, Cumberland, do what you want, there's not enough time left for Cumberland to come back and win the game. Basketball, same thing. And this is why you start having the fouling and everything. Hockey, same thing. And you get the pulling the goalie strategy. Uh, soccer, it's soccer, sort of, you know. Um, but baseball, it's not over until you've gotten your three outs in your last at bat. You can always come back. So exponential is fine in terms of it's going to assign a very small probability. The reason the exponential is not a good model is this just doesn't happen to describe reality. At least reality today in baseball. It would say the most likely score is zero with exponentially dropping. And just if you look at the data, this just isn't what you see. So what I want to do is I want to introduce the three-parameter Weibull distribution. And so the more distributions you know, the more you can do. So the Weibull is extremely nice. Now in the three parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, which do you think is the easiest to understand? So again, even if you don't care about baseball, which I think is wrong, you know, this is a great <laughs> way to review a lot of the concepts we've done in math. Which is the easiest parameter to understand, alpha, beta, or gamma? Beta. Beta. What does beta do? So what will beta do? Just shift the graph to the left. Yeah, right. just shift the graph to the left or right. So if you're playing basketball, I don't care how bad your team is, you're going to score at least 20 points in a basketball game at the pro level. So you would want your zero point to be in a very different place. Okay, after beta, what's the next easiest thing? Alpha. Alpha. It just rescales things. <coughs> gamma is the subtle one. Gamma is the hard one. Gamma controls the shape. Okay? So here's a plot of several different values. So interestingly, if I take the Alpha equals one, I'm sorry, beta equals, no, alpha equals one, beta equals zero, gamma equals one, I get an exponential. So the exponential is actually a very special case of a beta, of a Weibull distribution. <laughs> and so here's lots of other choices. They're technically known as one bump distributions. You go up, you go down. Uh, one of the applications is in survival analysis. It turns out if gamma is less than one, you're in a place of high infant mortality, people don't live too long. Gamma greater than one, you have an aging process. You know, people get tenure and just keep staying on and teaching and teaching and teaching. Okay, so you can look at different <coughs> shapes and see what kind of behavior you have, which parameters are best for what you're doing. What uh, my thesis student, Victor Lugo, is doing right now is he's looking at linear combinations of Weibulls, which I think will be a lot more flexible. So rather than expanding something in a Taylor series, I'm actually expanding something in a Weibull basis. 
And so we've seen the gamma function several times. It's a generalization of the factorial function. And it generalizes the factorial function gamma of n is n minus 1 factorial. And it turns out if you do the calculations, the mean of a variable is alpha gamma to the 1 plus 1 over gamma plus beta. And similarly, you can get a formula for the variance. So we can calculate these values very nicely and have closed form expressions. So I'm going to just quickly go through the calculation. I know a lot of you love integration and you love seeing all the algebra. And it's good to just get a sense of how you do these calculations quickly. So here is the calculation for the mean. I have x times my probability density. Well, everything here is occurring as x minus beta to the alpha. So let's add 1. Or I'm sorry, add 0. Multiply by beta, add by beta, divide by alpha. Well, if I add by beta, I've got beta times the probability distribution that integrates to 1. So I've got plus a beta. And now, I basically just increase the exponent of this by 1. I do a change of variables. And you know when I do my change of variables, I end up getting a gamma function. I can integrate the gamma in closed form. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why the variable is so nice. You give me the parameters, and I can easily tell you the mean. Or conversely, if I have some statistics that tell me the observed mean, I can then try to predict what the parameters should be. All right, so here's just a snapshot to just show you. This is not just your professor waxing philosophical. Major League Baseball and websites like this actually use things like this. They call it XWL in many places for expected one loss percentage. They need something that's much shorter because you know, there's so many columns they want to display. They need something that's you know, very easy to review. And so you can see how well the teams do. Okay. You might remember this problem from the midterm, so I'm not going to go through it now, but as you're trying to figure out which problem, which, I'm sorry, which formula is the best predictor for a team's winning percentage. And so here's just going through a bunch of other special cases in case you missed some of them. And then here's a geometric proof as to why this works. Uh, it's you know, using conditional probabilities. So it's a way to kind of justify that formula. All right, so now it's time to do a theorem. So I proved this back in, two, sorry, it was published I think back in 2006. It was inspired by a question one of my you know, students at Brown had asked me when I was teaching mathematical statistics. So assume that one scored an allowed per game are drawn from independent variables with parameters alpha rs beta gamma, alpha ra beta gamma. I'll assume they have the same gamma, the same beta, but they can have different alphas. Uh, if gamma is greater than zero, the one loss percentage is the following. So this is essentially the predicted number of runs scored to the gamma. So it's essentially the Pythagorean one loss formula. What might you be a little bit interested about? What extra assumption have I put in? I put in one other assumption about the coefficients. I'm assuming gamma is greater than zero. Uh, if gamma is less than zero, you actually get the more runs you score, the less likely they are to win. Now, it still works. It's just in terms of actually modeling things in reality, you know, no matter how little you know about baseball, in general, the more you score is better. There's only a few times in baseball where it's actually bad to score extra runs. I'll leave that as an exercise to try to figure out when is it actually bad to score more runs. I can think of at least two situations. Typically, I take beta to be minus a half. And the reason is runs scored and runs allowed, even though I want them to be continuous, they're not. They're integers. And by taking beta to be minus a half, I've set up my bins. So as I said earlier, my integer scores are right in the middle. If I chose beta to be zero, my bins would be from zero to one, one to two, two to three. And my scores would be at the extreme end of a bin. Ugh. If I score 1, 1, should that be in the 0 to 1 bin or the 1 to 2 bin? It's you know, right at the edge of both of them. But if my bins go from minus a half to a half, 1 half to 1 and a half, oh, okay, it's clear. I score 1, 1, that's in the bin from, okay. So here's the proof. So x and y independent. If you do the calculation, here is the uh, observed mean and, ga and um, for both runs scored and runs allowed in terms of the parameters. All I have to do is calculate the probability that x is greater than y. Well, this is just a double integral to do. Uh, amazingly, we're not going to interchange the order of integration. We're going to just roll up our sleeves and do it directly. So y goes from beta to x, x goes from beta to infinity. Well, the first thing I can do is I just put in what the values of the functions are. I then just change variables and I shift by beta. This integral is not so bad to do. And the reason is I have e to the minus crap to the gamma, crap to the gamma minus 1. This is screaming at you do a u substitution. Let u equal crap, or crap to the gamma. And so when I do that, the integral of this isn't so bad. I get 1 minus an exponential. Oh, well, I've got a probability distribution from 0 to infinity times 1. That's going to just integrate to 1. And now I'm left with something over here. 
Uh, I want to just make sure I have absolutely no physicists in this class. <laughs> if there were physicists in the class, they might be happy at this point because they see something that looks a lot like the problems you have when you have two-point masses and trying to figure out what's the effective mass of the system. Or if you have resistors and you're adding them, I forget if it's in series or parallel, in terms of how things add. When you go through, I have over here an exponential to an x over r, alpha rs to the gamma, exponential x over ra to the gamma. I have x to the gamma in both cases. And so if I just combine the exponents and call that new thing 1 over alpha to the gamma, it looks a lot like a rival. The only thing that's wrong is I don't have the right normalization constant. That's not a big deal. I can just, you know, futz around a little bit, put things around, set up so it looks right, do the algebra, do some more algebra, and everything just simplifies nicely, then substitute in, and there's the formula. So it really follows simply by doing the calculation. I was led to this formula by trying a simple case first. The first case I tried was the exponential, because exponential is easy to integrate. The next thing I tried was something with the form x e to the minus x squared. And the reason I tried that is I'd seen that distribution in physics. And then it was like, ooh, I can do both of these cases. Is there any function I know, any family of functions I know, that interpolates between the two? And that led me to the Weibull. So because of this, I've actually gone in to go to major league ballparks and have private meetings with general managers. I've actually gone in my students to go. I have never met Jake Peavy, but I did meet his dog. <laughs> uh, it is interesting what you get to do and who you get to talk to. And so if anybody's interested in stuff like this, I'm happy to share some of the stories, but when the camera's not rolling. <laughs> Alright, so I have randomly picked a season to analyze. Uh, let's do 2004. This part is you know, more fun the more Yankee fans you have. Alright, so this is just you know, a really good season to analyze. So here is the observed best fit rivals for the Red Sox. Now I've ordered the teams based on number of wins, except for the Red Sox who I have bumped to first because they did win the World Series that year. And I will list them before the Yankees. Good fit or bad fit? Good fit. Good fit. Perfect fit? And so the question is, how do you tell if something is a good fit or bad fit? So this is where you use statistics, and this is where some of our probability will help in terms of driving tests. So what you can do is you can look at how many runs you expect to get in a bin, divided by how many runs you, I'm sorry, how many runs you expect to get in a bin, and subtract that from how many runs you observe in the bin, square it, and add these all up. If your errors are normally distributed, what's the sum of squares of normals? This is a way to review what we've done this semester. Chi-squared. So really you can do a chi-squared test with stuff like this. And you can calculate what's the probability if things are really independent that I would observe a value of this error this large or larger. And if you get too large of a value, you can be pretty sure it's not a good fit. If you get a small value, you can be pretty confident. New York Yankees, okay, Boston Red Sox again. New York Yankees, good fit, bad fit? Looks pretty good. I mean, again, I'd like to see chi-squared numbers. I'd like to be a little bit more mathematical. I am a mathematics professor. It doesn't look horrible. Baltimore Orioles. Tampa Bay Devil Rays. And yes, they were the Devil Rays back then. So they may have sold their soul, but they really knew how to decay. You know? <laughs> It was worth I mean, it's a dream. Toronto Blue Jays. <laughs> but what do you know about Toronto? Cold. Nope. Cold. 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 Indoors. Nope. Canadian. Canadian! <laughs> right? Canada! Yes, it could be a metric issue. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> Toronto is <laughs> Canadian. Okay. It's probably Canada. nothing to do with Toronto being Canadian. <laughs> uh, back then, we might have even still had the Expos. I can't remember when the Expos became the Nationals. I think it was after 2004. Alright, so let's do a little bit of advanced theory. So, imagine you get really, really bored and you have a lot of free time. There are two unreasonable assumptions in this class, but let's say you're going to flip a million, a fair coin a million times. You expect about, 50, about 500,000 heads. What do you expect the scale of the fluctuations to be? Want a quick guess? Rough estimate. 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million? million? What do you expect the fluctuations to be around a million? So if you toss n coins, you expect fluctuations to be of what scale? Really? 
N over but square root of n. So square root of n is about a thousand. So I expect fluctuations on sides about a thousand. So it turns out 95% of the time I'll be between 499 and 501,000. So if I consider n independent experiments of flipping a fair coin a million times, if I do this five times, I have a 22.62% chance that one of my sets of a million flips will exceed this tolerance. If I do it 14 times, which was the number of teams in the American League in 2004, I have a 51% chance. If I do it 50 times, I have a 92% chance. If the data is too good, it could be fraudulent. I would be shocked if my data was outstanding. You know, I've got 14 teams, I've got at least a 50% chance that one of the teams will be bad. And so when you look at the chi-squared values, you know, the Toronto Blue Jays, it's 41.18. 51% of the time it should be at most uh, 31.41. There's something in statistics called the von Ferroni adjustment for multiple comparisons. So when you're doing the same experiment many times over, you have to inflate your numbers a little bit. And so this is something you would get into a stats class. The number inflates to 41.14. Oh, that's pretty good for the Toronto Blue Jays. Yeah. It's essentially getting it now. All right, so the other thing which I've talked a little bit about is the data analysis for structural zeros. When we're doing all of our tests for independence, we have to take into account the fact that you can't score and allow the same number of runs. And so this is done in greater detail in the appendix, but you, know, you are able to take this into account. And this is a wonderful application of advanced stats. So to just you know, really quickly summarize, uh, if we look at all the different teams and look at the observed wins versus the predicted, the games were off by, on average we're off by about four games per team. Uh, the Cleveland Indians were very kind back then, did a beautiful job of you know, exceeding, no, I'm sorry, of meeting expectations. The best fit value I get for game is about 1.74 for the mean, uh, meeting about 1.76 standard deviation 0.06 very close to the 1.82 that's numerically seen to be the best fit. There's lots of avenues for future research. You, know, you can find parameters such as why those are good fits. Um, I'm sorry, you can find parameters such as why those are good fits. The run scored runs allowed is statistically independent. It's a good consequence of our model. I'm pretty close. The future research is a microanalysis. And we're actually doing this in Victor's thesis right now. It is taking into account the fact that runs are scored in ballparks. Not all ballparks are the same. A run scored at Fenway is not equal to a run scored in other stadiums. Uh, other sports, what happens if you look at other sports? Uh, are there other things you can get a closed form integral from other than Weibull's? And then of course, as I said to you, the big issue is valuing runs. So this is a blitzkrieg introduction to mathematical modeling. You, know, you are at the point where you can do research. And you might say, yeah, but this isn't really using that much advanced mathematics. Fine. Baseball is a multi-billion dollar industry. This is more than enough mathematics to be making a contribution and to help teams allocate their resources efficiently and optimally. And so as Williams graduates, especially if you've taken a stats class and a programming class, you have very marketable skills. And that's what I wanted you to get out of this lecture. As well as, of course, the Red Sox. Red awesome. Sox, great. Yankee Sox, something along those lines. All right, so we will do, I think, some examples of research I've done with small students uh, on